Thank you all so much for joining me tonight virtually and welcome to our most recent uh, history talk, Winter Memories in Harbor Springs. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Beth Wemmelgloss. I'm the program coordinator and collections manager here at the Harbor Springs Area Historical Society. Been with the Historical Society for 10 years now. Uh, it was 10 years as of November, which is very exciting. And this is the first time I'm doing this presentation. So you are at the premiere of this Winter Memories presentation and I hope that you will all enjoy it. I am recording the presentation with the hopes that I will be able to get a recording link out to all of you in the not too distant future. Um, we do occasionally have these recordings fail, but we'll see what we can do. Before we get started, I did want to remind you of two other upcoming events we have uh, yet this week. Um, in two days, on Saturday the 16th, we have our final market um, of the season, Market at the Museum. This is a holiday market, a joint venture between the Harbor Springs Farmers Market and the Historical Society. We have 13 different vendors who will be at the History Museum on Saturday from 9 to 1. It's fantastic. You can get all of those last minute gifts and stocking stuffers and food that you need for the holidays. So we really encourage you to come out for that. We had almost 300 people at the November market and we are hoping to have even more at the December market. It is the last farmer's market of the year. So we hope to see you Saturday from nine o'clock to one. Coming up after that, um, January 18th, we have another Zoom. It will be me again. So if you would like to join me again, January 18th, it's a Thursday, same time, seven o'clock, also on Zoom, I will be doing my Restful Resorts presentation. And that is a presentation about my exhibit that we have downstairs here at the History Museum right now, which is running through March. And it is all about the emergence of our resort communities here in Harbor Springs. So that's what's coming next here with the Historical Society. You can find out more about both of these programs on our website, which is just harborspringshistory.org. And again, please follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. All of those places are good places to find out more about our programming and about what we have coming up. All right. And again, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, please feel free to put them down in the chat feature. I'll be watching that uh, as we move through here in case anyone has any uh, anything that they would like to share. I would love to hear from you. All right, that's enough of the housekeeping. We can go ahead uh, and get into it. So when I started thinking about this presentation about winter memories in Harbor Springs, I myself am a transplant to Harbor Springs. I've been here in the area about 11 years or so now, 10 with the museum itself. And so some of these traditions I've only experienced recently. And I was curious how far back some of these traditions go. And we're not gonna take it all the way back to the ice ages, to the glaciers that formed the Great Lakes that formed our deep natural harbor, the ski hills. I decided that going back that far would be a little bit too much for this presentation, but we're going to take it back to a, about the Victorian era. And just um, a quick reminder as you pop in here that you will be muted throughout the presentation to cut down on background noise, but if you'd like to have your videos on, you are welcome to do that. So this presentation is all about traditions in Harbor Springs, memories in Harbor Springs during the winter season. And I learned so much putting this presentation together and I'm very excited to share it with you. In these two pictures that you see here, uh, you see a lift at Nub's Knob on the left and on the right, you see uh, Reuben Hildebrandt and Doug Hill ice fishing in about 1952 uh, out on the harbor. So, our icy past, living in what I would call a, a naturally uh, conducive climate for this sort of thing, it gets cold up here. People need excursions uh... in the winter, they need something to do, and that is, you know, where we come in. So we are lucky that we have such fantastic winter weather here in Harbor Springs, and people realized that 
for centuries. Beginning in about, I would say, the 1850s, 1860s, the Victorian era, something became extremely popular. And as you can see from this slide, it was ice skating. You don't really picture Victorians in their beautiful dresses, wearing corsets and these longer skirts and fur trimmed hats, ice skating, but they sure did. Uh, roller skating was actually the big craze at the time, but it translated into ice skating in the winter. And you see some of the ladies are actually ice skating on skates. Some are being pushed in these little sleds by their companions, which is pretty adorable. I love this image. Again, the Victorians, uh, that sort of era, which runs from about 1850s through the turn of the century, is when this craze really became popular. And it was a craze. Any place that had even a little inland lake, a pond, you know, a stretch of street that they could ice, there was skating happening. These are some newspaper clippings from our area talking about ice skating in particular with a lovely lady there on the left demonstrating some ice skates. And uh, I'll just read a couple of them to you. They, it's a little bit tricky to see them, but I had so much fun doing the research for this presentation and finding these, these little notes back in our past. So the first one we have from 1882 over here is talking about Henry O'Connor. And Harry O'Connor set up a skating rink. It said it opened last week with an exhibition of ground and lofty tumbling. The hall was plenty large enough to fall down in and nearly everybody learned by experience. He goes on to say that eventually he wasn't sure that he wanted to, you know, try to go out and ice skate himself. But the editor does say, eventually we girded on a pair of trucks and sailed forth. The result was a surprise and a delight. The surprise was ours and the delight was all on the part of the spectators. If you read on through that entire article, uh, he eventually falls down and everyone laughs and it's a good moment. That's 1882, right here, downtown Harbor Springs, Harry O'Connor's skating rink. We don't know exactly where it was, but these other two documents here, this one, Otto Gix, he's fixing up a place on the harbor for a skating rink. So all they did was they went out, they cleared the snow off of the top of the harbor and it looks like they had the fire engine out yesterday flooding the ice. I'm not sure if they put up some sort of structure or what exactly happened with that. You would think the harbor would be enough ice but maybe it wasn't quite uh, smooth enough and so they flooded to, to make it uh, a nice smooth surface for skating. One year later we have Charles Werner who proposes to supply our citizens with an opportunity to enjoy skating all winter long. He has arranged to keep a rink on the harbor in front of the ferry house and admittance is placed at the low price of 10 cents. So you can see here in Harbor Springs, ice skating was really taking off. Now, we don't get a ton of mentions of rinks after this, but what we get is nonstop mentions of as soon as the ice comes into the harbor, uh, the men and the boys, although I'm sure women were out there too, the newspapers talk about the men and the boys out on the ice skating back and forth whenever there was a moment to do so. And this continues right up to today. Ice skating, of course, is still very popular. Moving on to another winter sport, although we will circle back to ice skating a little. Tobogganing. Tobogganing or sledding also became extremely popular in the Victorian era. So this is a uh, later picture here on the right of the Petoskey Winter Sports Park and their toboggan run, which is very sophisticated, these wooden sides. Uh, but as early as 1886 and 1885, you have mentions of tobogganing in the local newspapers. I love this one at the top. It says, talk about tobogganing. Tis the same sport to what young American male and female indulge in here. A slippery path has been worn down the bluff from the schoolhouse and girls and boys ranging from five to 12 years old come sailing down the almost perpendicular incline like meteors, in some instances turning over and over before reaching the bottom. Tis fun for the boys and girls, but we wouldn't care to do the patching up in their families. 
If anybody has been on the recently reconstructed boardwalk, you can picture exactly how steep that hill might be. So by 1885, uh, we have quite a few uh, young people apparently just bolting headfirst down that hill. Now, uh, it goes on to say that tobogganing is as much the rage in Michigan towns and villages as roller skating was a while back. Not too long ago, because roller skating, again, was really picking up at roughly the same time. But you can see how popular it would have been. Now, there's not many more mentions of tobogganing um, until we get to um, this moment here in 1929. So this image is of a, gosh, they must have one, two, three, four. 13, 13 people on that bobsled, if I counted correctly quickly. And, you know, you could probably fit more depending on the size of the person and how close you were willing to get to each other. But that's uh, about a dozen people on a bobsled. It's pulled up East Hill um, by Olaf Sorensen's Model A. You can see he's got two different toboggans strapped up behind him and they would come down one at a time. Now, in 1929, East Hill down coming into town was used. They apparently tried to use Judd Hill or Hoyt, but the turns onto Third Street was just a little bit too difficult for them to navigate between those sleds. Let's see. Oh, you count 24 between those two bobsleds? That is a lot of people. Now, we have a wonderful oral history interview with Joe Jolaret. It was conducted in 1991. And he talks a little bit about sledding during this time period. And he says, so what we did was we started at the top of East Hill and roughly where the care center is, they took a channel about four foot wide on the side of the road and they iced it clear until it come right down to the corner, right on State Street, they iced it. So what you do is you would get on this big bob sled and they would pull you up by your truck clear up to the top of East Hill, and then you would get on the bobsled and go dashing down. Sometimes you would go clear over Kilbourne's yard on Harbor Point and turn around before your sleigh would get stopped. That is quite a run. Now, to my uh, delight and astonishment, there is video of this from 1929 that I am going to share with you. Um, a collection of film reels was donated to the Little Traverse Museum over in Petoskey, and they had that digitized um, by Pierpont Productions, who was kind enough to share this footage with me. So let me pull this up and make sure that you can all see this. I have to adjust my, sh my screen share just a little, so bear with me here. All right, hopefully you can see that just fine. And I'm going to show you the sledding. Now, there's no sound in this uh, this reel, but it's ski joring and coasting on Main Street. If you don't know what ski joring is, it is this. You get a rope, you attach it to the back of a horse or a car, and you ski behind it. This is Main Street. You can actually see the courthouse right on the right here. And they are absolutely flying. And you can begin to see the channel on the right-hand side of the road that they would have slid down. So this, I'm, I just have to pause it quickly so you can really get an idea. This is those 24 people on the sled in the image that we saw a moment ago. And it just, it blew me away to be able to see those people in both that picture and then in this as well. So they go up the hill, being pulled by Olaf Sorensen's Model A. And then in the next little bit, we see them coming down East Hill. They're just a little tiny speck back there at the moment, but they are gonna come sailing right past. Again, you can see that they sort of have a, a track or a trench there on the side. And here they come. 
and they all waved to the cameraman. And unfortunately, I don't know who the cameraman was or where exactly this video came from. I'm, I'm just tickled pink that we have it. All right, here they come again. <laughs> Looks like they have some eager spectators there. In this same oral history interview that we had with Joe Jolaret, he mentioned that if they wanted to turn these bobsleds, the only way to do it was for everybody to lean to one side at the same time. And so the person in the front was called the driver. He was in charge of sort of steering and telling people, turn or left. And you can see here, they've made it all the way down. They're going past State Street a little bit of trouble turning there. And let me, I believe that this is just them sailing past again. It is, but I'll let that play out just one more time there. All right. And now we're back to my other screen. Again, let me just adjust this here so you can see perfectly. There we go. We're going to come back to that footage because there's a couple other um, images in it that I uh, want to share with you. Now, the year of 1929, I think one of the reasons they ended up setting up the bobsled is because there was an unprecedented amount of snow, just an unreal amount. We have quite a few pictures from 1929. These two are candids from the yearbook. But then we also get pictures like this where you can see just how high up the snow banks were getting. This is the Hollywood gas station, which is now Johan's right on the corner there. We do have a caption for the image on the left. It says the big snow of 1929, driver Alton Campbell. So that must be Alton there on, on the top of the car. Now, I'm going to briefly, briefly take you back here to this video. Thank you for bearing with me through the, the screen changes here. Because this is still 1929, and they are ski drawing again, but they're doing it on the harbor behind cars, and this just seems so dangerous. You can see someone wiped out on the left there, and these cars are just... Zoom in right on by, and there's the skier right behind it. They certainly look happy enough. Now this, again, is that exact picture. That's Alton Campbell showing you the snow drifts there in the big snow of 1929. And this is them attempting to clear that snow drift in 1929. That definitely would have been a snow day. At least I would sure hope so. I'll just let this footage play out a little bit. And again, this came to us from the Little Traverse Museum over in Petoskey. Ooh, that's my next section. We gotta, we gotta pause, we gotta go back. Okay. So those were the first sort of round of tobogganing down East Hill in 1929. Now, there's a few years of quiet and we don't hear of really people bobsledding much. I couldn't find anything in the newspapers again until about 1935. And in 1935, they decide to move the tobogganing from East Hill, which perhaps was beginning to have a little bit more traffic on it and moved it to Bull Moose Hill, which is just uh, over by, uh, by 4th Street there on, on Bull Moose Hill Road. Now, you can see here they are making quite a big deal about it. And this bobsled, it wasn't just get a whole bunch of people together, hop on the sled and go down the hill. They made a specially constructed track that had banks to provide safety. And so in this newspaper image here on the right, they are calling for people to get out and dig because a great deal of manual labor is involved in constructing the harbor bobsled slide. 
They called them slides at the time. The first fairly warm day will have Barb, uh, Bob Armstrong and Mark Graham. They want as many men as they can spare the time to come and help with the preliminary icing of the slide. So not only do you have to plow the road to make you know, a, a track, you then have to build up the banks on either side to keep the bobsled in the slide. You have to ice it to get a nice smooth run. And the city actually came out and agreed to light the slide as well. And so this was a fairly big production. And it's not much of a surprise to me that though it was extremely popular, it, it didn't always happen. Sometimes there just was not enough labor to make it happen. But you can see a couple of years here in a row, it does end up being um, a very popular event. Here in 1935, we have over 100 people enjoying the first night of thrills on Bull Moose Hill. And it talks uh, about there are five bobsleds that were kept in operation. They're manned by capable drivers. And so you don't just get to go down on your own this was also an adults only sort of slide. Children weren't permitted because there was quite an element of danger to this quick iced bobsled. And the track ran straight down State Street. Um, it came down for quite a ways. Now at this time there was a Harbor Springs Winter Sports Club. And um, in 1937, uh, let me see. Yeah, 1937, the club had Howard Armstrong as the president, Leo Cassidy as the treasurer, and Reverend Ralph Young as the secretary. Now, eventually, the sort of uh, winter sports club managed to get a, a little bit of a sports park together, but it was less of a, a park and, and more of a farm that they could go out to. It was to the west of town off of Ridge Road. And residents could go there, they could sled, skate, have some other official, you know, uh, fun winter sports, but it wasn't, it wasn't really an official winter sports park like Petoskey had at this time. And so the club eventually ended up going to Petoskey and using their sled over there. So again, we go from 1929, there's a little bit of a hiatus, 1935, 36, it's revived. But again, after a couple of years, it, it, it dies off. Finally, again, in 1948, the tradition is revived again. This time it is A.J. Zuber um, who uh, plans these efforts. He is, um, as it says in this newspaper article, a former bobsled driver. And they propose a revival of the Bull Moose Hill sled, um, sled slide tunnel uh, to city council and it is approved. So again, the city agrees to light the hill and they make plans for a work bee to get people out there to build the slide. The club spokesman said that safety will be the first consideration in building and operating the slide and only experienced drivers will operate the huge bobsleds. Now at this point they had actually lost some of the sleds. They had gone into storage and they managed to find quite a few of them. Um, the run will be located over the same course used in the late 1930s. So this is again, still on Bull Moose Hill, starting at the Harbor Point Golf Course and heading um, down 131. It's a one mile course. They mentioned that several of the old bobsleds have been located, they're reconditioned, they're inspected and they're put back on the run. So this is when we get some of these um, sort of iconic images of bobsledding in Harbor Springs. These are Virgil Haynes images from 1948, which is when that bobsled slide opens back up again. Unfortunately, I don't have video, but we do have a couple of these really charming pictures and uh, it shows you here, this newspaper clipping mentions um, that the bobsled drivers on Sunday afternoon were Bob Lauer, Walter Cook, Judd Smith, Ward Wallstrom, Kenneth Pfeiffer, and Pete Wilson. Dale Ang uh, Angel, a novice at the bobsled, made one trip with a load. He's being tutored for future runs. 
So this again was extremely popular. It was held usually a couple of times a week um, in the evenings, again, adult only. You can see in this picture on the left, the width of the slide, and it looks like it doesn't really have banks. It doesn't look like that big of a detail, but this is the top of the hill. And as it's coming down, you can begin to see here that the hill uh, is getting steeper and the banks are getting higher in order to keep everyone in there and together. And as far as we know, there were no serious accidents that occurred on these bobsleds, which surprises me a little bit. Apparently, occasionally, uh, they would, you know, take a tumble into the banks, but no one was ever seriously hurt. I think this is something we should probably bring back. I think it's fantastic. Um, and I don't go into it here, but of course, uh, eventually Harbor Springs does get a winter sports park in Kiwanis Park in 1973. The Kiwanis Club um, begins that project. There was for a time a skating rink behind the high school, an ice skating rink that they operated whenever they could. And, uh, you know, today we have, you know, other places that we can sled, but gosh, doesn't this just look fun and slightly irresponsible? All right, moving on from tobogganing to another popular winter sport, ice boating. Now, again, I said ice skating was popular, but one of the things that grew out of ice skating was that they would have sail skaters. And the sail skaters was literally just a person on a pair of ice skates holding uh, basically a kite, uh, a homemade sail, and you know gliding around the lake that way. And eventually, of course, this grew uh, into boating itself. And ice boating, again, it became popular in the late Victorian era, around the turn of the century and was a very popular sport and it remains extremely popular today although the ice boats of today as as we'll see in a second don't really look like this anymore these are two very early ice boats this is the slow poke over here and this is our harbor we can tell that um well i can tell just by looking at it but behind them here there's a dock and this is the little traverse ferry dock you can almost see uh, the roof of the ferry building back there. So this is about turn of the century, maybe by maybe 1910 or so. And then up here we have the Bluebird, which is another Harbor Springs uh, ice boat. And these were just two, oops, sorry about that, two of the ice boats that we had uh, on the harbor. There were many, many more of them. Okay, so that lovely video from 1929 has people ice boating. Again, this video is just a treasure trove. So I am gonna go ahead and play you a little bit of this. This is again, a little bit later. I think it's still 1929, definitely maybe 1920s. You can see the boats are very similar to what they were, you know, 15 years earlier. And here they are just having a grand old time. Pretty neat turns, actually. And there is a brief clip of someone, there we go, on ice skates with a sail of their own. And I believe this is up around the Petoskey State Park where they're at right now. There's that gentleman holding onto his sail and just skating away like windsurfers. All right. Again, sorry about that. Let me just readjust my slideshow here. There we go. So again, ice boating was extremely popular. It was a fun way to enjoy the ice that included uh, ice skating. And it was, it was used as a form of transportation to get from Petoskey to Harbor Springs or up around to Cross Village, but not all, not particularly seriously. Um, obviously, you can't take large loads of goods or, or things like that across on an ice boat. So 
These are a few other images of ice boating in the harbor, obviously from much later. These images we have here on the right are from about the 1950s, 60s. Um, and this image over here is from a magazine um, in 1975. And ice boating, again, has continued to be very popular. We actually have an article about ice boating in one of our Northern Origins journals, so you might have seen that. In the 1960s, there were briefly organized races in Harbor Springs, um, ice boat races, uh, although it seems that the only person who actually owned an ice boat at the time was our own Dave Irish, and that he was the one sort of sponsoring uh, these boat races. Now, ice wasn't just something that was used for recreation. The ice in our harbor was also an extremely important commodity. So for decades, the residents of Harbor Springs uh, and people everywhere else had to get by without refrigerators, uh, which weren't invented for home use until around 1913. And even then, well into the 1930s, people without reliable electricity or who couldn't afford you know, uh, an electric ice box used just plain old ice boxes in their house. Now, this is one, uh, an early image of ice harvesting. This is what we, um, I believe this is the Knickerbocker Ice Company and it's from around the turn of the century, maybe 1899, 1900 in there. Now, the Knickerbocker Ice Company was actually from, um, uh, Cleveland and later sort of the Grand Rapids area, but from Cleveland. And what they did is they, down in the, the lower area of the state, the southern part of Michigan, the ice didn't freeze thick enough for them to harvest. And so they actually set up shop in northern Michigan. Now, when you harvest ice, you can see this warehouse here is just one of these um, basically very hastily constructed ice houses. And the ice houses, let me go back one slide, you can see the beginnings of it here in the background and this conveyor that they're using to haul ice blocks up to the top of it. So this is one of the, again, very sort of hastily made structures. And this is the other side of it where you can see them stacking the blocks of ice. So what you do is you stack these ice blocks, obviously very high, and you cover the top in either straw or sawdust, and that insulates it and keeps it from um, thawing, basically, well into the summer. And so starting in about April, May, they would begin shipping this primarily to Cleveland by rail. You can see here two newspaper articles on the side. These are from 1890 from the Daily Resorter newspaper. And it says the Knickerbocker Ice Company of Cleveland is taking about 25 car loads of ice per day out of their ice houses here. And that is not one third of the Harbor Springs ice that has been removed. Now, 25 car loads, that is a train car, not the cars that we would think of them. Again, this is 1890. 25 train cars of ice every single day going to Cleveland. You also later have another mention that the recently developed industries in Harbor Springs include ice houses placed here last winter in response to the call for that article of necessity and because of the unequaled purity of the product. So Harbor Springs, of course, is named after our deep natural harbor and the artesian wells or springs that we have in this area. And so the water was thought of as especially pure, which makes especially pure ice. So not only are we lucky enough that our ice freezes to the appropriate thickness up here in Northern Michigan, but our ice was apparently especially tasty. Now, this industry supported dozens, if not hundreds of workers for you know, the several weeks that they harvested ice. And I thought I'd include a few pictures here of what the ice boxes in a home might look like. So ice is harvested from the harbor or from any other body of water. It is moved to an ice house, basically a warehouse full of blocks of ice. And then there's an ice man who comes around to your house, much like the milkman and delivers blocks of ice. 
and you put them in your home ice box. These two are both from 1890. You can see the one on the right is obviously much more elaborate than the one on the left. The one on the left, you would put a block of ice in this top portion there and you would store your milk or other items in the bottom. And then over here, this closed cabinet is where you would put the ice and you have all of these other drawers for your foodstuffs. I couldn't help including this. Um, on the right, we have two little ads for local ice businesses, uh, the Barnafire and Ingalls Ice Companies here in Harbor Springs. Those ads are from around the 1920s, maybe into the 1930s. And you can see this is a 1920s era ice box. So this on the left is the block of ice, usually about a hundred pound block of ice. And the air circulated through and cooled everything in there. And I found this diagram on the left, which cracks me up. It is from the United States Department of Agriculture telling you not to wrap your ice. Apparently, Ice that is wrapped melts slower, meaning you have to buy less ice, but it doesn't cool as efficiently. And when you're concerned with keeping food fresh, even a few degrees off makes a big difference. Now this image on the right, I mentioned that there were ice men who brought ice to your home. You would have a little square sort of window sticker that you would put, uh, you would punch what you wanted, 25, 50, 100 pounds of ice, and then they would deliver it to your home or your business. Well, during World War I, this is one of those jobs that fell to women. And so here on the right, we have a picture of two ice girls or ice women who are delivering these huge uh, 100 pound blocks of ice to homes. So ice harvesting was a big, big business. It was a big industry in Harbor Springs and it worked hand in hand with the lumber industry. The lumber industry in Harbor Springs was absolutely booming and the sort of byproduct of all of this sawmill activity was sawdust. And that is what the ice houses needed to coat the tops of the ice house and keep it insulated. And so I'm sure there was some sort of uh, exchange there as well. Many of the area resorts had their own ice houses. Uh, Harbor Point, for example, had their own ice house that they would fill independently of the sort of big companies that were harvesting for places like Cleveland and downstate and other cities. We, of course, had our own local ice houses. Um, even small businesses like a meat market might have its own ice house because it uses so much ice and storage. So I have another video that I'm going to share with you from uh, roughly the 1940s or so. Um, and it is ice harvesting on our harbor. Now, uh, in these two images here, you see um, uh, uh, 1949 on the left, you can see some of these ice blocks coming down conveyors and being loaded into a truck. And then on the right here, you have uh, Harold Hahn, Harold Hahn, uh, in 1952 with a mechanical, you know, gasoline plowered ice cutter, which um, generally became popular and, and part of the industry by about 1930. So we're still cutting ice here in our harbor um, by 1952. So let me see if I can, um, Give me just one second, sorry about that. I just need to open the other, no one of course it's, uh, of course it's hiding from me, sorry. Give me just one second here. There it is, the ice harvest. Okay, let me readjust my screen for you here so you can see. And again, this one has, uh, no audio, but you can see there is some hand cutting going on. So these long, long rows would be cut with the mechanical cutter, and then they would cut smaller pieces off with hand saws. And we actually have quite a few of those um, hand saws, ice tongs, all those kinds of things in our permanent collection here at the museum. So you can see he's using a long pike there. 
They separate it into smaller chunks. It gets put onto the conveyor belt. And again, you can see how many men are employed in doing this work. Going up the conveyor belt, coming down where it is hurled into a truck. Gentlemen, they're catching it and placing it more appropriately into nice, neat stacks. And again, the ice needed to be about 12 inches thick, at least, um, in order to make a good ice block. Now they are loading it from the truck up another conveyor belt into the ice house, the warehouse itself. And as they come in, they're just lining up the ice, filling that entire warehouse. A lot of these tools are really similar to what they used in logging to move around um, logs, the tongs, the, the, the pikes, the PVs, very similar sort of technology. Even the saws are similar. He's shaving off the top of some of those ice blocks to make them a little even so that things stack more appropriately. And here we have the gasoline powered ice cutter. And you can see a little bit of uh, Harbor Springs in the background there as they're cutting through the ice. And there's actually a ship in the background of that one. That's the, I believe it's the Gulfster. I'd have to look that up. Don't quote me on that. Um, but it's wintering in our harbor. Okay. Let's move this screen back. And this is just one final picture from the ice harvest. Um, this is in 1961. So things are still, um, ice is still being harvested at this point. This is Midge Leonard, Ty Miller, and Vincent Cooper with those old time tools there. Now, finally, one of the other things that you do on the ice is you fish. So you're not just cutting holes in the ice to harvest the ice. Sometimes you're cutting holes in the ice so that you can go fishing. This is a postcard from, I believe, the 1940s showing a northern Michigan ice village, uh, which uh, is Harbor Springs. You can see Harbor Point in the background a little bit there. Ice fishing, of course, has been popular for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, the local Native American populations were doing ice fishing uh, long before Europeans came here, and it's still a tradition continued to this day. And you can see even uh, the newspapers, of course, mention that uh, how important this is. So you can see here, 1915, we have a newspaper clipping that mentions quite a number of unemployed uh, people in Petoskey and a number of others who enjoy the sport have either erected their fish shanties or are getting ready to do so in preparation for the annual ice fishing campaign on Little Traverse Bay. Later on in 1932, you have another little article here that really drives home that not only is this a sport, but it is needed sustenance, it is an important food source, and it is also an important job and income. Like it mentions here, the unemployed of Petoskey um, and others, day laborers, are, are interested in this type of work. So in this article in 1932, it's mentioning uh, ice fishing is a past art at Cross Village this winter. The ice lid has not shut down on the rolling waves of Sturgeon Bay, where other winters this watery expanse frozen over presented all the aspects of a great level snowfield covered with fishing activity of many descriptions. They go on to mention that the lines and spears of which the Odawa are so adept still hang in tangles of last year's cobwebs. King Winter, usually so dependable, has failed this winter in providing a much loved sport and for many a needed occupation. And so uh, again, ice fishing was not just a sport, it was essential. And one of those traditions that has uh, continued on now, some people just simply put up what amounts to a tent uh, or a tarp on the water, anything to block the wind and keep you a little bit warm. But ice shanties themselves are generally made of these lightweight materials so that they're easy to transport. You can drag them out on the ice 
um, either uh, pulling them yourself, or if the ice is thick enough, uh, you could drive out onto the ice. Here we have a few fantastic pictures from the 1950s. This is Leslie helping and his son Donald in February 52. And on the right, we had a contingent of ladies from Chicago. I believe they were uh, ski champions of some sort, and they are pictured with Floyd Hoover, Steve Graham, um, Lloyd Taylor and Harold Hahn of the Chamber of Commerce in 1957 um, out on the ice for one of the first times. And being one of the first people to get your fish shanty uh, out on the water was considered quite the accomplishment. Ice fishing doesn't seem to be as popular now, but it used to be that you would look out on the harbor and there would be a hundred ice shanties on just our little section of Little Traverse Bay. And of course they were doing this all around the Inland Lakes um, and the Great Lakes. Over by Charlevoix, it was called Smeltania um, because they were catching so many smelt up there. And so this was a, a very popular pastime. All right, um, let me see. How long did the ice from one winter last into the summer? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, it depended on the year, um, how good the ice harvest was. So if the ice harvest was particularly poor, uh, there were worries that the ice supply would not last. And so it usually ended up lasting at least um, through September, October until it would start to cool down again. But it really was a stretch um, to keep ice uh, for that long in the quantities that were needed. And that's one of the reasons that these downstate companies started coming up north to ensure that even during warmer winters, they had enough ice to harvest. If anybody else has questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll uh, take a look at that here in a minute. So moving on to one final tradition um, here in Harbor Springs during the winter time, our municipal or community Christmas tree. For people that are born in Harbor Springs, this, I don't know if uh, you realize how special this is. I was not born and raised here. I'm, I'm from Ohio. And I know that many other small towns have little tree lightings or displays, but the first time you come down the hill in Harbor Springs uh, and you see the tree at the end of Main Street, it is just this warm, fantastic feeling. And when you find out that this is an unbroken tradition going back to 1915, it just makes it that much more special. This picture is from around the 1920s, 1930s, and you can see the tree there. Now this tradition goes back, as I said, to 1915. These are some newspaper articles that confirm that. The municipal Christmas tree. At the last regular meeting of the village council, acting on the suggestion of Reverend E.A. Black, it was unanimously agreed to give the village's moral support to the idea of a municipal Christmas tree. Now it's said that local contractor George Hartung was the one who first cut and transported that tree from the swamps near his home in Larks Lake into Harbor Springs. And the tree was actually in Zorn Park. It wasn't in its current location. So it was in Zorn Park and a committee uh, was developed in order to make sure that this was a fantastic community celebration. So you can see the committees here. There was a tree committee, uh, a lighting committee, a decoration committee, an entertainment committee, an investigating committee, and a finance committee, and a publicity committee. There were a lot of committees. And on one of those committees was Abigail or Abby Shea. This is a picture of Abigail right here. She is Ephraim Shea's granddaughter. Um, Ephraim Shea passes away in um, 1916. So this tradition gets started um, just in the last year of his life. But his daughter, uh, granddaughter, pardon me, granddaughter continues to be a part of it for many years to come. And she actually dresses up as Mrs. Claus with George Newark here as Mr. Claus. Um, I believe this is about 1919 that they dress up. They're seen here in front of the Judd Street entrance to the Shea House, um, posing for a picture. And then in their uh, modified sleigh, there um, on Bay Street, passing by the Shea House, um, on their way to the community Christmas tree celebration. Now this celebration beginning in 1915, 
always included Santa Claus. And so this is a little newspaper clipping from around that era, again, 1915, 16. And it says, everybody, men, women, and children will go to the big Christmas tree doings held Christmas Eve at Zorn Park. If everyone will help boost it, it will certainly be a great event for Harbor Springs. The kiddies should write their letters early before the candy and nut supply run out, so old Santa will have ample time to buy. Direct all your letters to Santa in care of Mayor Gould, who will surely see that he gets them and be early on hand for old Santa believes in being prompt. And so they passed out something like 2,000 bags of candy and nuts to area children the, that first Christmas. Again, that first tree was in Zorn Park. The following year in 1916, the newspaper reports that it was placed on the dual lot at the corner of Main and Spring Streets. We think that it was moved to its current location on State Street right here um, around 1921, but I, I couldn't find newspaper articles to back that up. These images here, again, are from the 20s, 30s, um, not completely positive, but I'm, I'm sure it's in that, that era. You can see everyone gathered around the tree there. Now, in the early years, you can kind of see it here. There's a cable holding the top of this tree to the Stein building there, uh, which is now uh, houses uh, Visions and Elizabeth Blair Fine Pearls. And we have uh, the uh, Holy Childhood Church there and Johann's is on the corner, just to place you. And this is looking the other direction, of course. The bottom of the tree was supported by railroad ties and the top of the tree was supported by guide wires and cables. Now this was not always particularly effective and the tree fell frequently. Frequently enough that the city of Harbor Springs decided to come up with a better solution. It was around sometime in the 1990s, early 2000s, correct me if you know, um, but the idea came to longtime electric department employee, Dick Barkley and Dick decided after years of resetting falling Christmas trees to create a manhole cover meets tree stand. So today's tree sits in a specially constructed tree stand that is, um, it uses a six foot section of 20 inch pipe and five tons of cement. And the manhole cover, which uh, was specifically created for this project, um, sits over it during the rest of the year. Now the city's electric department also connected the stand to the existing electric box um, on the north side of the street so that all of the uh, electric lights and everything can be uh, underground right there. So this system has worked extremely well. Uh, the only reason that a tree would fall over um, is when it breaks. And so as was the case last year uh, of the tree toppling, the tree didn't actually fall over. It snapped right at the base um, and was blown over that way, but the tree stand itself did not fail. This is an image of one of the trees being transported into Harbor Springs. I'm not sure about the date of this photograph. Again, I think it's roughly that 1920s, 1930s era. Uh, you can see in this case that there's a large amount of ground that came with that tree, I assume to help hold it in place um, between that and the railroad ties, hoping that it would stay. Now, as I mentioned, Santa Claus was always an integral part of this celebration. These are just a few candid photos from 1954 um, taken by Virgil Haynes, uh, showing Santa interacting with the crowd. I thought these were particularly lovely images. And as I mentioned, that very first tree lighting in 1915, there's a newspaper article that talks about there being 2,000 people who came to see the tree lighting. And there was an equal number of bags of candy and nuts handed out to local children. I can't mention uh, Santa without showing you this. Um, slightly hideous, well-worn costume. This is from the 1930s, and it was made by Dorothy Holliday, 
very appropriate last name, for her husband, John Holliday, who wore it and was Santa in the 1930s. Um, it includes uh, seven pieces. It's the pants, a pair of gloves, uh, a hat, two fake beards, uh, a wig, and then the coat itself. You can see the, the gloves and the second fake beard over here, which also doubles as a, a face warmer. The newspaper article in the center there just mentions that the Harbor Springs men are assisting Santa around town, um, visiting all the rural girls of the district with candy. And it's the Elks Club that is helping them do this. And it also mentions um, in person here, it mentions John Holliday and Joe Jolaret as being part of those efforts. I also couldn't resist showing you some of the most popular toys in the 1920s. Um, just as an example of what Santa might have brought to people. Some of these things I, I didn't realize were quite this, uh, quite this old, but uh, in the 1920s, we have Raggedy Ann making an appearance alongside her storybook for the first time. Teddy bears remain extremely popular. Lincoln Logs were invented at this time, and we have Crayola Crayons making their first appearance, as well as this 1923 uh, auto race game, which I thought was just fascinating. So a quick shout out to 1920s games. They were kind of fun. And again, I can't mention Santa Claus and this tradition without bringing up Ephraim Shea, or as he was known in 1914, Santa Shea. So let me just read you very briefly. Um, Ephraim Shea was a obviously well-known person in our town. I've done several lectures about Ephraim Shea. I encourage you to go watch those on our YouTube page. But adding to his list, his long list of accomplishments is a very generous act. So in 1914, just a few years before his death, the Petoskey Evening Newspaper reports, and this is in roughly January, E. Shea has always been a friend of Harbor Springs boys and girls, but he has never made them quite so happy as he has this last winter, since he undertook the remarkable task of building bobsleighs and sled cutters for all the girls and boys that should call at his office and ask for them. The article goes on to call Shea a veritable St. Nicholas, and it notes that his machine shop has been transformed into a toy factory while the orders are filled. Eventually, by the end of that year and into 1915, Ephraim Shea finishes more than 460 sleds for local children. These are two of the sleds that he created. We, are, have, um, we have them in our collection here at the Historical Society. This one on the top was actually just donated a few years ago by the granddaughter of the young boy who received it uh, as a gift in 1914 from Ephraim Shea. There's another note um, that relates to this picture of Ephraim here on the left. This picture is actually labeled Shea with flowers from kids. I was always curious about that, so I dug a little deeper and found an article that says, on Christmas day in 1915, crowds of youngsters gathered downtown. The purpose of their meeting was to purchase Ephraim Shea a bouquet of flowers to show their appreciation for his kindness. Each of the children was allowed to contribute a penny from each person so that everyone could contribute to the flowers. And uh, it goes on to say that the children paraded down Main Street with their flowers. They're all very proud. Uh, and they present them to Mr. Shea with a little speech. Needless to say, the gift was highly appreciated. Uh, so much so, of course, that he takes a picture um, by his house with the flowers that the children got him. Included here are just another uh, few images of the downtown municipal Christmas tree, the tradition going strong for almost 100 years now, or more than 100 years, I should say. 2015 was 100 years. A few more more recent images. These are from the 1980s and 90s. Uh, Bruce Gaffman is the photographer of these.
And with that, we have gone officially for an hour. And so I am going to close there. Um, I want to say thank you so much for joining me. As I mentioned, I had so much fun researching this uh, and putting together these slides and these images. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to see them in the chat. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a minute to type some of those questions. If you have any uh, questions or comments, but wait, there's more. While you're typing away, you might notice uh, a glaring uh, hole in this presentation. And that is that I didn't talk at all about skiing or the ski resorts in Harbor Springs. Uh, there was just too much. I, I couldn't fit it all in. But luckily, uh, our very own Jim Bartlett here in Harbor Springs has done an hour long presentation about Nub's Knob, and it is up on our YouTube page. And so I will direct you to people who know much more intimately about that history. And um, the ski hills, of course, got their start in about 1950s and uh, are still growing strong today. Uh, but if you would like to learn more about those again, please visit our YouTube page. We have many, many presentations there about all different aspects of Harbor Springs history. We have um, one about uh, logging in the winter in Northern Michigan. We have one about the Great Lakes icebreakers um, called Operation Taconite that uh, of course is sort of winter themed and uh, the presentation about Nub's Knob as well. So. Go to YouTube, Google the Harbor Springs Area Historical Society, and we will pop right up. Uh, let me see here in the chat if there are any uh, questions here. Uh, lots of Merry Christmases. Merry Christmas to all of you as well. Happy holidays. If you're in town, I hope you will join us Saturday at the last indoor holiday market here in Harbor Springs, um, our market at the museum. It's from 9 to 1 on Saturday. If you need some last minute stocking stuffers and gifts, we have them here. Uh, at the museum. And let's see, any other questions? Uh, maybe you said, where was the ice house in Harbor Springs? So there were many, many of them. And usually they ended up in um, uh, just random locations right along the shore. Um, in the image, let me pop back to it. This image, uh, I think this is East Hill in the background. It's it's a little hard to tell. So this would be roughly where Ottawa Stadium is today. Basically any location along the shoreline with, with easy access to the ice so that they didn't have to truck it as far was ideal. But for example, the Knickerbocker Ice Company put up 20, you know, sort of, quickly built ice houses. And then again, each of the resorts might have had one. And so there wasn't just one location or one ice house. There were dozens of them, um, some for local use and some as warehouses storing for places like Cleveland uh, and, and Detroit. So it was an, an export from us. That's a good question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, let's see, do we have any more questions? I don't think I see any more questions. I'll, I'll give it just another second in case anyone does have anything pressing they'd like to ask. Uh, but again, thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I will try to have a recording of this presentation. Uh, up on our YouTube page soon. So if you missed part of it or you wanna show it to your friends, it should be there. Thank you again for supporting the Historical Society, for supporting our programming. It means the world to us and your support is what allows us to continue to host programs like this.